हेलो एवरी वन वेलकम टू द सीजन टू ऑफ मोबाइल यू एक्स पॉडकास्ट हेयर वी कवर इंटरेस्टिंग वेब टेक्नोलॉजीज एंड कम्युनिटीज सो टू स्टार्ट ऑफ सीजन टू विथ अ बैंग वी हैव अ स्पेशल गेस्ट विथ अस टूडे एल एन मॉन कमरी uh he is a mobile app team lead at his company idox and they work in ionic and so we invited on, him on to talk about his experience with ionic what they've been doing and how he feels about the framework and its future yeah it was really interesting talking to ellen mm-hmm. uh, i really enjoyed the part where we discussed misconception people still have around hybrid apps right yeah this is going to be a long episode because we had a lot of great things to discuss and just a lot of knowledge being shared so i hope you guys enjoyed the episode and see you guys in the next episode so hey alan welcome to the mobile ux podcast uh how are you doing today yeah really good it's great to be here right thanks for coming on with us uh today we're going to be discussing about you and your work in ionic basically the apps you work on and how you feel about the industry basically yep sounds good So why don't we get started with um why don't you introduce yourself to the podcast basically and then we'll get on from there. Um I'm Alan and I'm from uh Belfast in Northern Ireland. Uh just outside Belfast actually, but it's easier just to say Belfast because people actually recognize Belfast. Um so I'm from here, lived here all my life. Um I I'm a developer. I have been in development for around 7 or 8 years now professionally. Um so I finished my degree uh around 7 years ago and then the company I work for now um is is actually the company I did my placement year with through university. So in my 3rd mm-hmm. year of uni I I undertook, you know, professional experience and it was actually with the company that I'm still with today, which is quite cool. Um so I've been able to grow in that company throughout you know the the seven years and and see the company grow as well from um grow from a really small company into a massive global company which it is today um so that's a bit about development um yeah there's not much else to to explain about myself so you mentioned idox where you are and where you've been since you started your career right so yeah. tell us about idox uh you said they've grown greatly so how you've guys have been on that journey what you guys do and specifically what you guys what you do at idox and your team i guess okay yeah so idox um as a company is a globally massive company right so there's over a thousand employees in idox however whenever i first joined um the company I'm in uh and this will make sense in a second um I joined a company called Tascomi right and it was a really small local uh software development house okay so there was whenever I joined there was maybe I think there was nine of us there was nine people and I was one of maybe four or five developers and mm-hmm. it was a really local company it was uh, you know it was a 5 minute drive from where I lived at the time and you know it, it the atmosphere in that company was very family like you know it was very close knit and everything that we were doing everyone knew um exactly what you were doing because it was so small just just under 2 years ago the tascomi got bought by idox so idox acquired tascomi as a company so um although i i work for idox i still like the i still like to bring up the the whole tascomi era you know because mm-hmm. that's really where i grew as as a developer and and that's what i know and that team that core team tascomi still exists within the idox group but i still like mm-hmm. to refer to it as tascomi sometimes because um we still have that sort of family like nature you know um in terms of my role um my role is mobile team lead um that's the official title right um although it only recently it's became a proper team right so um it was around 4 4 or 5 years ago that we decided um actually before we were acquired by idox we decided that we needed to offer some sort of modern mobile solutions to our customers you know um and it was around that time where i came up with the idea of actually let's go native let's let's develop native mobile apps because from a user's perspective or a customer's perspective it's what they're comfortable with they can go onto the app store and they can download an app and they know how to do that you know if you give the term 
progressive web app or you know pwa to a customer not everyone's going to know what that means and not everyone's going to know how to interact with a pwa in the way that as a developer you would want them to so around that time it was my plan to create these native apps and get them out there and get the customers using them so my 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 title mobile team lead comes from there because i've created I've basically created the mobile team within our our team, and only only recently have I brought uh two or three people into the team to to work alongside me and um of obviously teach them you know what I've been doing, bring them up to speed, and there's two projects ongoing now which I'm actually leading as a mobile team lead now, which is cool. So it's not just me now, which is nice. Um, in terms of what uh, IDOCs actually do. They do a range of things. Um, the main focus is the public sector, so the local government councils. So things like building control, public protection, uh, environmental health and licensing. They're, they're probably uh, some of the main products. So the likes of if, if a new building was to be erected, you know, it would go through the planning phase and it would be submitted to the, to the council and all of our software is used to do that from end to end, which is nice. And uh, uh, in terms of the mobile apps, what in terms of my role, what I do is I basically allow the, the officers or the surveyors within, that, within the council to basically take their work out on site with them in, in the form of a mobile app, which, you know, obviously gets rid of um, bringing their, their filing structure out with them and lots of notes and stuff like that. Um, so that's, that's really, really fun to be included and be involved with that sort of side of it um, because it's obvious that you're making a big difference to someone's job and you know, mm. you're, they're, they're obviously saving time and uh, they're, they're not going to be frustrated by mountains of, of paperwork. So <laughs> that, that's in a nutshell what IDOX does um on a bit of background about idox and obviously a bit about my role wonderful you know it's always great to like have that family kind of knit between mm. the people you work with and it's great that you got to keep that even though the original company that you started yeah. with has merged into a much larger corporation like that yeah. feeling is what really kind of helps with the motivation because if you're working in a cubicle it's just not as like fun to work yeah. and kind of that's that's de- it, yeah. it takes and the magic away one one of the best things about that company is how close everyone is and you know the relationship between each person you know i i know in a lot of companies you probably can't approach the likes of project managers or mm-hmm. sales team and have a you know a really general casual conversation with them whereas in our company i can i can go to the sales team and i can have a really good conversation with the guys there just as I would in my personal life, which I think is brilliant. Right. You know, you mentioned something interesting that I wanted to follow up on, which is yeah. you said it's all uh, because customers, you like the feeling of a native app, right? Instead, like yeah. PWS can sometimes confuse them. Interestingly, the field we work in, which is more of the B2C retailer side, yeah. we've seen that there's a trend towards PWA. So do you have okay. like a thought process of like where you think native apps are the right way to go versus when there's maybe a better experience to be had in browser maybe? Yeah, um, I, obviously it's just my opinion. Um, but I think if I am um, a Joe Bloggs who, is, who, who has a smartphone, if you mention, in my opinion, if you mention a mobile app to someone, they immediately think app store, you know, mm-hmm. the, that's mm-hmm. my sort of reasoning behind it. They immediately go onto the app store and they search for what they need and, you know, they download the app and the apps on their phone. Um, experiences in the past, we have, we have developed PWAs in the past and, you know, they've, they've been good, good, good PWAs if, if they're used properly, but sometimes the user just thinks that they're mobile websites you know and to a certain degree yeah if you look at it from a high level that is what what a pwa is but you know you want in my opinion you want the user interaction with the app to be to the maximum and in my opinion going down the native route and offering them an app through the app store where they're naturally going to go and look for it anyway 
mm -hmm. think is the best route, you know, for us. But in terms of PWAs in general, I, I do love PWAs. I think they're very powerful. And I think whenever people start to catch on, you know, actually I can, I can install an app from my browser and I can interact with it the exact same way um, without having to download it, download it from the app store. Once, I think once that starts to circulate and people become more familiar uh, with that mm -hmm. sort of style of app, then it will really, really take off. But I think for now, native for us is definitely the route to take. I just think I think a proving ground is going to be you know I don't know if you've heard about um, Amazon launching their game streaming service on uh, as a PWA. Yeah, 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 I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah, so I think if that some stuff like that in the mainstream starts to catch on, yeah. I think we're going to start to see a real exactly, yeah. shift. As we talk, as you talked about those mo native mobile apps, there's a lot of different ways that those can be executed, and yeah. the way we I actually connected with you was your involvement in the Ionic community. So yeah. tell, can you tell me more about how you've got to Ionic, what your experiences with developing apps with that is? Yeah, so this happened around uh, probably four or five years ago. Um, as I was saying, like whenever we came to the realization that we actually need to go mobile and we need to offer these solutions in a mobile way. And mm -hmm. uh, it was myself and a colleague, Kieran, who actually lives in Australia now. And uh, we were we were posed with this with this problem, you know, how how do we build a mobile app? That that was that was basically the question. How how do we do it? How do we do it? Mm -hmm. Um, and we went off for I think it was two or three weeks um, research and development time, just uh, mm -hmm. basically grabbing technology and trying it out and seeing what worked best and what would fit in our team in the best way. Um, so. So uh, he looked at Flutter. Uh, I had a I had a good look at React Native as well. Um, we were <laughs> we were con contemplating just going completely native and using Swift and Java. Uh, that was a thought as well at the very start because we didn't we weren't aware of what these technologies that existed. And then we stumbled upon Ionic, and this th th it completely blew our mind. And we were like, it can't be this easy, you know. How can it be this easy to, to build a cross-platform <laughs> mobile app with mm. with one with one code base, and we don't even yeah. need to know any specific language? So we're just, we're, you know, we're basically writing in JavaScript. So mm, at that time, yeah, we, we found Ionic, and uh, it was actually Kieran who found Ionic uh, before me. So um, I was I was trying to prove out my React Native sort of uh, project. And he came along with Ionic and built built a built a, a test app, you know, ten times faster than I did in React Native, and that that was it. That was it. That was a solid foundation. That was good research, and it really fitted our team for what we needed at that time. And obviously, you know yourself, Ionic and Capacitor has have grew since then. You know, that's like five years ago now. It was version version one or two that we started with. And now it's you know that those technologies are massive and they're getting more popular, um, so I'm really really happy that we chose that route over the likes of um, Flutter or React Native. Um, yeah. Uh, so I have this question that uh, uh, you said that uh, users are really not uh, much into uh, saving that home uh, screen app. Yeah. Uh, from website uh, and I agree with that and uh, yeah. uh, people are much more into downloading it from the official app store yeah uh, so is this uh, the main reason for you to move into native apps or uh, you also think that uh, on web browser uh, we are uh, unable to means uh, most of the web, uh, popular websites are unable to give the app like experience that's a good question um I think at the time the main reason was just to give a really good user experience and mm -hmm. for our users then it was just give them a full blown native experience which mm -hmm. obviously is going through the app store. Um, I think in the future we will maybe offer uh, the same solutions as a PWA as well and give that sort of um, option so if people want to just you know visit visit a, a URL and install the app, then they can. And people who are more familiar with 
you know, the, the proper, I, I like to say proper app Correct, experience, yes. then they can go through the app store. But yeah, mm -hmm. I think that is probably is the main reason. I think with Ionic, though, even with native apps, I think what's great is there's still a difference between running something in a browser, like the feature, the native hooks that Ionic gives you is really useful, especially when you're building very specialized apps that have kind of more intensive experiences. What do you think, yeah. Alan? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree, yeah. And uh, so sometimes if, if you don't build your app with a creative mind, especially with something like Ionic or any sort of uh, like framework that you use, it's very easy to to notice that it was built in Ionic. If you know, if you don't, if you don't uh, have a creative mind when you're developing certain parts of the app, then you can very easily just tell, you know, that well, that's that's an Ionic app, you know. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, just kind of like uh, I, as a more like technical side of a question I had was I, I noticed. You used to work in Angular. I think this was on your own website blog. I think you. Yeah. I think when you started, you mentioned that you were an Angular. You used to use Angular frameworks, um, and then you switched over to React. So yeah. I was just curious why you chose React over Angular, and if right. maybe Ionic didn't support React, is that something you'd still be using? Yeah, um, I think whenever we first came across Ionic, at the time, um, it the only sort of modern JavaScript uh, framework or library that um, worked with Ionic was Angular at the time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So at that point in time, we, we saw that as a really small learning curve to, to start building mobile apps. So it was, either, it was either learn Angular then, which obviously is just JavaScript, so it's easy as a, mm -hmm. de as a mature developer to pick up, or go down the route and learn, you know, something like Flutter or React Native, which is completely different. Um, and we, we saw the Angular route to be the best option. You know, it was, mm -hmm. the, it was the quickest to learn. It was easiest. It was just JavaScript. So, you know, we picked it up within a couple of hours anyway. And, um, and that was the main reason why we started with Angular, because obviously there was no other way, you know. Um, obviously, Ionic team, the Ionic team announced React, and I was learning React in my spare time because I, I, I just love learning new uh, technologies and keeping up to date nice. with modern and, and mm -hmm. uh, learn all those types of things. And we had never used React in, in our workplace specifically, um, but obviously I was using this stuff outside of work and becoming, you know, quite proficient in it and um, Ionic announced Ionic React and I, and I was like, well, we need to switch. We need to switch to <laughs> React because, you know, I'm, bec I'm becoming this expert in React and, and I'm, I'm using Angular in, in work w when I could be using React. So I think uh, the question why React over Angular, it's basically, it comes down to I, I know more about React and I'm more confident in React. And I know if someone poses me with a problem, I, I can come up with a solution very quickly in my head using React. Whereas if I was to use Angular, it might take a little bit longer. I could still do it. Obviously, it's, it's all just JavaScript at the end of the day, but it would take a bit longer. You know, the thought process, the, the planning, the preparation, the coding. But with mm -hmm. React, it's just fast. I, I think it's fast. Would, would we, what was the, la the last question? If, uh, it was basically just if Ionic didn't support React, is that something you, would you drop, which one would you drop, React or Ionic? Okay, uh, um, I think we probably still would use Ionic, so we'd probably be using Angular, um, and I would just have to live with that. <laughs> it, it, you know, it would be a bit of a personal loss for me, but um, yeah, I think Ionic as a whole um, doesn't matter what sort of framework or library we're using with Ionic. I think we'd still use Ionic. Yeah. yeah. One of the most like that thing about having the ability to use any framework and the way they've created their component system using web yeah. components that work yeah, on yeah. any framework is just a technical achievement to me. Like whenever I see that in action, yeah. I'm just impressed. It's it's so nice. Um, when you, when you look at their web components under the hood and just figure out how they work and how you know, something built with Vue.js, for example, 
can be exactly the same as if it's built with React is just incredible. I think that mm -hmm. is amazing. And to offer yeah. that as a, you know, obviously as a company, to offer that as a solution to developers to choose mm -hmm. what they want to build in, that's incredible. Really, really cool. Really well done. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Alan, you have mentioned that uh, uh, initially you moved to Angular uh, in Ionic because it was similar to JS and yeah. uh, then you were learning React because this was, uh, means it was kind of the next cool thing. So you were uh, tr uh, exploring it uh, and, yeah. and then when uh, Ionic uh, switched, uh, start giving support to React, you were uh, excited to have it. Uh, in Ionic and you start working on uh, React. So yeah. uh, this is like a story to uh, most of the developers. Uh, they were working on JS, then they were uh, working on Angular, then uh, yeah. React and uh, these kind of things. Uh, so uh, what do you think, uh, how should, uh, what's best for the developer? Uh, to s uh, keep switching uh, between the apps or, uh, I mean, keep switching between the technologies? Uh, um, or they should stick to some uh, technologies learned that uh, along uh, in the deeply and then uh, yeah. try to explore new technologies? Yeah, I think um, obviously, obviously the answer to that question is stick with one, you know, um, because long term it's going to be better, especially for a company, you know, maintainability and readability mm. of your code and stuff like that. I think at the time, though, for us, it was still uh, it was still kind of fresh, so it was okay mm -hmm. to change. Yes, yes. I think mm -hmm. if it was maybe maybe six months or a year later, we probably couldn't have changed because you know there would have been too much code written in Angular. Um, mm -hmm. We actually still have one app that's written in Angular, and mm -hmm. it's actually in the process of being rewritten into React at the minute, and that's the last that will be the last bit of code in Angular that's left for us. And obviously, then that will just be scrapped. But um, I think I think if we had maybe two, three, or four apps that were built in Angular before the React uh, support came for Ionic, mm -hmm. then I don't mm -hmm. think it would have happened. You know, because as you say, you can't you can't you can't just jump between all these different technologies, um, especially as a business. It just it doesn't work. Um, but for developers out there, I think it is good to. To keep learning, and, and yes, and keep keep and up exploring new technologies. Hard. Yeah, like so. If you if you are an Angular developer, the mm -hmm. you know there's no harm in in going off and learning React and learning the the structure and and the patterns that React has. Um, the same same with Vue.js. There's you know there's no reason why someone can't go and and learn all of these things while still mm -hmm. sticking the one. You know. It, a main a main sort of framework or library for their main sort of job um but definitely i always say it's good to good to always extend your knowledge so you you know you're not just stuck Correct. with, one, with mm -hmm. one technology or one language and uh, there's another question that i want to ask you uh, how do you as a developer how do you feel uh, when uh, you have some massive change in uh, some framework like uh, when Angular 1 was there and they, uh, they have come with Angular 2, uh, that was a completely different thing. Yeah. Uh, I have heard that Ionic 3 and Ionic 5, do, these versions are totally different. And a uh, similar thing is happening with Vue.js. It's obviously, as a developer, it's obviously frustrating whenever mm -hmm. you've written things in a certain way and then things completely change and you have to go back mm -hmm. and maybe rewrite some of your code that was probably solid code for, uh, you know, years, you know, or mm -hmm. months or whatever. Um, but I, I tend to think that uh, in more recent uh, years and, you know, in the modern era of JavaScript, all of the documentation is, is great in terms of uh, migration from version, you know, version one to two, for example. Uh, yes. the documentation mm -hmm. is, is so extensive that as a developer, you shouldn't really have any issues. And if you mm -hmm. do, then maybe you shouldn't be using that. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah, I completely agree that a good documentation is uh, key for this my easy easiness for this migration yeah. between yeah. some drastic changes. 
सो वी हैव इनिशियली टॉक्ड अबाउट दिस नेटिव्स एप्स एंड पी डब्ल्यू एस नाउ आई वन आज दैट डू यू सी एनी एडवेंचर एडवांटेजेज एंड ड्रॉबैक्स ऑफ हाइब्रिड एप डेवलपमेंट वर्सेज नेटिव लाइक स्विफ्ट ऑफ फ्लटर जावा एप डेवलपमेंट um yeah well i think i'll start with the drawbacks and and be very very biased here <laughs> and say that i can't really see any drawbacks right now um, <laughs> um ob- obviously if if the like if i think on a general note um a draw a big drawback with hybrid is obviously you're not talking directly to the hardware yeah, you know hardware you, yeah you can't uh, that it's obviously where the term hybrid comes from um so if if you were developing some sort of app that is very uh uh hard on the hardware and you know it's powerful then you're going to have a little bit of speed issue and performance issues there obviously mm-hmm. you can't you can't get away from that um but i think i think to counter the counter argument a counter argument to that is um you know modern web browsers are very powerful you know our, our web browser now if you compare it even 5 years ago it's so powerful now and the things that you can do yes. just mm-hmm. with the browser is insane um and and i think if you were to say to someone 10 years ago that uh you could compare a hybrid app to a native app you know mm-hmm. a, a pure native app i think people would have laughed because they, <laughs> right. they would have thought no way but now mm. uh, you know you can't you can't tell the difference if it's if it's a if it's a simple enough or not simple enough but if it's a if there's not so much uh powerful features in an app and it's built properly and mm-hmm. you know the algorithms used and the patterns used in the in the code to to make mm-hmm. it efficient or are, are all are all done properly if you put mm-hmm. a, a purely native app beside a, a a hybrid app or a web native app as it's called now then you're really not going to see the difference um and on some on some occasions the the hybrid app is maybe going to be a little bit faster <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yes, correct so drawbacks yeah on a general note obviously you're going to have uh uh performance issues if you, if you push it right to the maximum that you know but you can't get away from that and it's a sit but it's the same for everything everything's going to come to a point where it's not going to perform efficiently but there's too many factors involved in that to actually yes. class that as a drawback because you know it it depends on the de- the developer who's writing the code is is his coding yes. style efficient you know or or her um it just it depends on so many factors um so drawbacks yeah the performance thing on a general note for me personally and for what we do right now the, there's been no drawbacks um in terms of uh advantages then so this this mm-hmm. i love this question whenever you get asked this about you know ionic or hybrid or web native or whatever obviously if we if we look at purely native apps for a second and think you know if if i was a, a company and i wanted to develop a native app for ios and android mm-hmm. and maybe release a web version as well let's let's just say this was a project um we're going we're going to have to hire in someone who knows swift right for the ios yes. side we're going to mm-hmm. have to we're going to have to build a a project around the ios team you know mm-hmm. project managers uh you know we're going to ha- there's going to be a lot of work around that we're also yes. going to have to hire in uh, a java developer for for android someone who knows java yes. if mm-hmm. if we don't have anyone who who knows java so we're going to have to hire in another developer so all of a sudden we've got two developers and that's only if it's a small project imagine this on a big scale imagine if if our project was huge and we needed a team of developers you know maybe maybe we have to hire five swift developers and five java developers now now mm-hmm. we've got two separate teams within a team which to me is crazy um yeah. and then obviously everything that comes with that project managers uh leads all that sort of stuff um so if it was a native app we've got all of that overhead all of that cost you know 
maintainability going forward as well is is crazy mm-hmm. because obviously if we were to develop in swift for ios let's take that as an example and pass that into for example the the support team who would fix bugs and and respond to customers and all that sort of stuff the, those guys on like a typical support team for a web development company aren't going to know swift mm-hmm. they're, there's no way they're going to know Swift because it's too it's you know it's it's too specific of a language for yeah. for a support developer, for example, to know. They they don't need to know Swift or Java. They just need to know mm. web development. If we're talking from a web development point of view, um, so a massive advantage of of hybrid apps or web native apps is um, it's cross platform. So. Obviously, yeah. we, we develop it once and we get it everywhere. So we get it on mm-hmm. iOS, we get it on Android. We also get a web version. If we want, you know, we can release it as a PWA. We can also release it through the, you know, the proper app store route. Um, so that is a huge advantage on so many different levels. Um, number one, fr- from a business point of view, it's gonna cost way less because if yeah. you're a web development company, uh, it's obvious that that as a web development company, you know web development, you know, you know the technologies included in, in web development, which is just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. When it, you yeah. know, if, if you break it down into what it actually is, uh, something like React or Angular is really just JavaScript at the end of the day. So from a web development team point of view, hybrid app, a massive advantage it's a massive advantage because it's a really easy transition um instead of going off and learning something like swift and java and mm-hmm. then obviously i mentioned there the cost thing with with a company if if we were to look at that and sit down and figure out how much it would cost to develop a purely native app across mm-hmm. different platforms it's gonna it's gonna be insane compared to compared to the hybrid route so that's probably the biggest advantage, in my opinion, of of um, of using of going the hybrid route. Yeah, I say for native, it's an, at this point, like you said, browser ha, browsers have gotten so powerful that it's like eighty twenty, maybe even like a ninety ten percent rule, where it's like you think yeah. you need that performance, but really like ten percent of those specialized apps that are using like yeah. Apple's like native SDKs that need like yeah. augmented reality or something yeah, yeah. and GPU intensive tasks, like that's when you really need to tap into that native hardware. Yeah. That, that's Apart so from great. that, it's just not. Yeah, it's just not native. Like you know, if you're building a simple app to allow someone to bring their work out on site, for example, like what we do. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't need that ten percent. Yeah. You know, they're never gonna need that ten percent. So yeah, it, like especially because most of these apps that people actually need are just crud operation jobs that, exactly. like, an Ionic yeah. app is gonna fly in. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Soar. Uh, so, uh, Alan, uh, do you think that uh, there is some misconception about hybrid apps that uh, you think people still have? Yeah, I think. Um, if you if you mention hi, the term hybrid app to someone, uh, mm-hmm. some people might get a bit scared and, and think, oh no, not not hybrid, you know, because mm-hmm. because of how much it's it's grew over the last let's say six seven years. Um, if you think way back to like a phone gap application, which mm-hmm. was literally just a, a web page converted into an app, um, mm-hmm. but when you look at that, that's exactly what what. A hybrid app is even today um, it's just mm-hmm. done a lot better it's just done uh, um, it's a lot more like slick experience now um, so if people aren't educated on on the modern you know the modern technologies and the modern way of working in terms of frameworks and libraries and how you can build hybrid apps then it's definitely gonna be a bit frightening mentioning that to someone um, if they're used to the term hybrid from years ago, but I think I think hybrid apps, especially uh, around Ionic and and Capacitor um, and Cordova, even, yeah. are really starting to get a lot more popular now. Mm-hmm. And I think people are starting to realize that they can build mobile apps with their existing skills. So the term hybrid, you know, 
the, the biggest misconception with hybrid is that, oh, it's not a real app. It, you know, it's a fake app. You know, I've heard yeah. that before. Oh, no, mm-hmm. we don't want a hybrid app because that's a fake app, you know. <laughs> um, but hybrid apps are becoming so much closer to native apps now. Uh, there's, there's really, there's no reason for anyone to, to misinterpret it. A, mm-hmm. a hybrid app for being something that's, that's not, like I, I always use the term, a proper app, you know, because it is, it is. Uh, that's the bottom line, it is now. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of people forget that, like when you build a hybrid app as a native app, there's, it's not literally just the website. What, what used to be phone gapped and there was Cordova and now there's like what Capacitor is doing yeah. is kind of just ju- juicing up your app on steroids and like giving it a lot of that native functionality that you would basically that differentiates it from just being a website. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it because obviously Capacitor and I is, is very powerful and you know, you ha- you do have access to all, all, all of the native APIs. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so if you want to build in a fingerprint sensor into your hybrid app, you can, and that that mm-hmm. is so powerful. Whereas the likes of like a phone gap app, it just wouldn't exist. People would have right. went, no, we can't use we can't use that um, that workflow because we can't access the file storage on the, on the phone, for example. Yeah. Um, a big thing for us in our apps is actually accessing the file storage storing mm-hmm. uh, files on the phone, reading those files, storing them offline, which gives us gives the users a really, really nice offline experience. Because if, if, I'm, a, if I'm a building control officer, for example, and I need to bring uh, multiple PDFs out on site to view plans mm-hmm. of a building, uh, and I can take those, and even if my phone goes offline, and I can still access those files and open those files and view those files from within my mm-hmm. application, that for me is an amazing bit of user experience right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which wouldn't have been able to be done, you know, a while back. Right. So switching away from the developer talk, I guess, I just wanted to kind of get into the designer side of your job. Okay. So as you design these apps, so even though they're for a little bit more of the industrial side of user experience, so but are there still, I imagine there's some critical elements that you keep in mind when designing these yeah. to make sure that your users don't hate you after using the app. So like, can you like just knock out a few of like yeah. what those things are that you think everybody else should keep in mind when making their apps? Yeah, there's a, there's obviously a lot of things that we can talk about here in terms of making an app feel like an app and and mm-hmm. what that is because that might that might be different to to two different people, you know, um, the way I like to to design apps and I like to think of a user using a really popular app, for example, like Facebook or or Twitter or Instagram or whatever and really tap into how those sort of apps deal with user interactions. Um, mm-hmm. A big thing in our apps, for example, here, here's a really simple example, actually, um, de- deleting something in an app or removing something. You know, in web development on, on, a, on a normal web solution, you know, on a web app, on, on a browser, you would probably have a button, right? A delete button. Let's yeah. let's make it a really easy example. A delete button, and it would pop up, and it would say, "Are you sure you want to delete?" Right. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas, from a design perspective for a mobile app, you really need to. I, I think, as a developer, you really need to think: How can this work nicely on an app? I, I can't just stick a button for every row of of record that I have because that that would be right. silly. We we only have a certain a certain amount of space on a on a screen, so how can we how can we deliver this in a nice in a nice way for a mobile app? And the simple answer to that is look at your look at your email client on your phone. How how do you how do you delete something on, on your email? You swipe it, you swipe it, <laughs> and you reveal a button. So things like that. Uh, and Ionic does that really nice with the sliding item uh, component, right. mm-hmm. and you can wrap items in a sli- in a slider, and we can yeah. just slide it across and access the button that way. Um, <clears throat> that I think that's a really simple example. Um, 
to to use, but it's it's really <clears throat> I think it's it's a really good user experience for someone who who is familiar with with mobile apps as well. Um, just other other things like uh, utilizing the the side menus for you know for to hold things in there related mm-hmm. to maybe a record that you're you're on. So if we had like a list of of um, records on one page and we click into one of those, the side menu for that screen from a design, from a UX point of view, should hold everything related to what you're currently on, which sounds really, really simple, but I've seen it done so wrong. And and that's just how it should be. The user should know that if they click the side menu, they're gonna get all the information about this particular thing that they're looking at. And that is simple, but it's really, really effective in terms of you know design and interacting with the user because that then they will get familiar with your app and they'll know that if they click a certain button or click in a certain area they know what they expect and if it's consistent across the whole app then they're going to have a really good experience right you know what's interesting is there's this thing in ionic that i haven't tried yet that i've been waiting to try i want to know if you've tried this yet is ionic lets you use eight multiple menus we know that but also it lets you pull in menus from the right and it's something yeah. that I haven't done yet, but is this something that you've been able to use in your apps anywhere? Because this experience is something that I've been interesting and wanting to do, but I haven't thought of a good use case to use it yet. Well, I think uh, whenever I'm designing an app, I like to have the main sort of action button on the left of mm-hmm. the toolbar, right? So if we were in like, say we had, uh, we, we clicked into a record and we had a, like a few a view files sort of, a screen that we could navigate to and we were viewing a list of files within that screen you would want to give the user the ability to add a new file for example right and obviously in a mobile app we don't want to stick this big ugly button in the middle of the page so we we utilize the toolbar and mm-hmm. uh, we use an icon an add icon which is familiar to a user they know what an add icon means that they're right. on view files screen so they know Mm -hmm. intuitively and naturally they know that if they click that add button it's going to let them add a file right Mm -hmm. and the way i the way i design the apps uh is if that sort of button should exist on a page then it should be in on the left of the toolbar it's just personal preference that's my opinion so in Mm -hmm. that case if if this page or screen had a menu as well, I would then move the menu to the right, and that's the use okay. case. Um, otherwise, it would be on the left, yeah, because it's just, I think that's just where the where the menu lives, on the left, in most popular apps, so people, mm-hmm. are, people are very used to having it on the left, but if you yeah. need to, you can move it if you, if you need to. Cool. So, you know, that's like the bulk of the questions I had for you today. And uh, Ashoria, if you have anything to add on real quick, feel free to, or Alan, because uh, now I just want to move towards the end of the podcast. Yeah. So, you're good? Yeah. So, Alan, you know, what's really what caught my eye is you just started your own podcast called The Mobile DevCast. It's about mobile yeah. development. And you also have a really exciting lineup that we talked about over yeah. DMs. So what's your vision for this podcast? What kind of topics are you going to ta- be talking about? And where can people find it? Yeah, so it's called uh, the Mobile Devcast. Uh, you can find it mobiledevcast.com. Um, I've only got one episode so far. Um, I've been really busy lately, so I haven't uh, got around to doing the second episode. But it will come soon. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but in terms of like topics, I, for me, I just love sharing my knowledge. I, I love talking about stuff that I'm passionate about uh, and that is mobile app development and if I can share my knowledge in this way and help a few people along the way then that's Mm -hmm. ultimately what I want to do you know um, and provide it in a way where you know if someone's driving to work they can stick on the podcast and it's only 20 minutes Mm -hmm. and they can maybe listen to it get some value from it uh, and move on which which is what a podcast is usually used for you listen to it while you're doing something else. Um, mm-hmm. So topics, things like Ionic that we've talked about here, 
uh, things like capacitor, um, but not limited to talking about uh, more native technology. So down the line, I might I might even talk about Flutter or or React Native, for example, mm -hmm. because the the main the main sort of structure of the podcast is focused on mobile app development, but you know I want to really push the whole web native hybrid sort of route for mobile apps, and I, I want to really try and make people aware that you don't need to know how to how to natively develop an app to develop an app. You can do it this way, and here's how you do it, and here's the resources, and here's some documentation. Here's a few examples, you know. So that's that's the main sort of sort of goal for me with that. Um, mm -hmm. It's just really to have a place to talk about it. Uh, nice. For me, I love talking about stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> if I can if I can do that and help people, then that's good. Yeah. Well, if you love talking about mobile development, we're we're always here. So maybe we can get yeah. you back on sometime to talk awesome, about yeah. other more specific things. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, as you yourself have also a YouTube channel where you do tutorials, so yeah. maybe like I know when we all start, I think everybody has when they start as a developer, especially in Ionic, they watch the Simon channel. Oh yeah. yeah so, yeah. do you have anything and use one person that you really like to follow in the Ionic or web development community that you want to shout out right now that you can shout um, out? Well, obviously, Simon Grimm is a, is a massive. Uh, yeah. He's massive in the in the Ionic community. Um, you know, whenever I started with Angular and Ionic, I would have used all of his tutorials and it would mm -hmm. have been great. Um, obviously, uh, with React now, his his tutorials are, are focused on Angular, but you can very easily convert it into React if you need to. But in terms of in terms of Ionic React, like YouTube uh, channels and stuff, I haven't really came across a really good one yet that that I know of. Um, I know there's a guy called Aaron Saunders who, who um, uses Ionic React and he has a lot of content on Ionic React. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like a go-to person, I don't, I don't, I haven't found one yet for Ionic React yet. Mm. Um, for for general sort of web development stuff, uh, I don't know if you've heard of uh, Florin Pop. He's pretty, he's pretty cool. He's done quite a lot of videos uh, and just. The structure of his videos and his content is quite nice and it's easy to follow um mm. so any anyone wanting to to have a look you know for general sort of tips and tricks his channel is pretty cool uh, does he have a different channel name or is it just his name because I, I don't know that's not ringing a bell yeah it's just just floor and pop yeah all right yeah i might check it out okay um and yeah that's pretty much it really yeah but si nice. simon Grimm, he's obviously the biggest name <laughs> yeah yeah so you know as the, oh sorry did you have something Go ahead. yeah so um as also you mentioned like you're always exploring new technologies and stuff there's i feel like i've also felt like in my in like in our company i feel like every now and then i find something which is like oh why haven't we been using this yeah, yeah. and so is there anything like that that you found that you feel like people or it's underrated and you feel like people should be giving more attention to yeah i really think uh like something that I've really been looking into lately is, you know, like headless CMS, uh, mm -hmm. Strapi, Strapi JS specifically. It is so powerful. And I, I think all the time, you know, why can't, why can't we use this in our workplace? Because it's, it's simple to use, simple to set up. Uh, you know, the front end on it gives, gives us a nice uh, overview of what we have. The, the content uh, type builder and stuff is nice. Um, but in, for that, I would use that um, if I'm developing something in my spare time. So projects outside of work, I would lean more towards using a headless CMS instead of uh, writing a full blown API from scratch in like PHP mm -hmm. or something. You know, I, I would go down that route and uh, within, within, within 30 minutes, you've got all of your API endpoints right at your fingertips and you're, you're ready to go. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's really fast. So if you, if you use that in conjunction with a mobile app, then, you know, it's really good user experience because it's fast. Obviously that's the main, the key point. So yeah, I think uh, to be specific, Strapi, Strapi is awesome. And I think anyone listening, 
if if they if they haven't came across Strappy before, definitely go and give it a go. Uh, really easy to set up and have a play around with it, and you'd be surprised how how powerful it is. You know. Awesome. Uh, this that's pretty much all I had for today. Uh, let me know if any any last questions. Now's the time. Yeah, all good, all good from me. Yeah, it's been really good. Cool. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having this discussion, and I'm sure you'll be back soon on our podcast. Yeah, so, I, I would love to come back on anytime. Anytime you want me, I'll I'll be here. <laughs> sounds good. All right. Have a good day.